Lord, we want to worship you. We want to fellowship with you. We want you to minister to us. I know there are some here who had a decent day, perhaps a good week, and there's some here that that is not the case. And maybe they need a special touch, a special blessing of grace. So, Lord, we just pray that you would work in our lives. Lord, I pray that we would really, I know this is hard from the scriptures. I think for every Christian, sometimes they struggle with the scripture that all things work together for good to those who love you and are called according to your purpose. It's easy to quote that and say that, Lord, when things are in category good, but when things are in category bad and we're going through the trial and finances aren't there, or whatever it is, Lord, we can struggle. But Father, we need to understand that nothing happens in our lives that doesn't pass over your desk first. And, and you promised that. That's your promise to us. So Lord, may we just see your goodness in your hand in our lives. Come what may. And we just want to just grow in our faith. I know I need to, Lord. We all do. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
your children. In your children. Father of life. from you Lord even you know obviously with healthy parents Lord we just as we would chastise our, our children and we do it because we love them because if they don't you know, they don't realize sometimes what they're going to do they're going to get hurt just are so grateful, Lord, for your presence in our lives. You said you'll never leave us nor forsake us. We're never abandoned. You're always with us, pouring out your grace in our lives. So, Lord, may we just have eyes to see it and a longing to be with you.
Lord, that's just, that's just shouted all through the Old Testament, the Psalms, all through your word. There is, there is no one like you. You are set apart. You are holy. As Pastor Mike has always taught us, Lord, those, those creatures before your throne are not saying that because you need to be reminded. It is a declaration who you are, your greatness, and to think in all of your greatness, and you might say your hugeness, and all of your power, which is unlimited, little old us, we're the apple of your eye. Wow, Lord.
Let's all stand. Savior, I come, quiet my soul, remember, redemption till your blood was spilled for my rest. pray that this evening, that that's where we would find ourselves more times than not. May we find ourselves kneel there in the morning as we begin our day, and there just, you know, die to ourselves and bring everything to you, Lord, and walk in the light of that. 
that you're not only our Savior, but you're our Lord. And your ways are right. Um, No disputing that, Lord, even if we don't like it. Your ways are right. They're altogether pure. As we go through Proverbs, we're going to see that, Lord, as we're studying through that book on Wednesday nights now. Your ways are right. There are rewards and there are consequences to not following it completely, Lord, and we're going to look at that this evening. So, again, Lord, you know, everything in our life that is good begins at the cross. Everything that is right begins to death to self and just walking in your ways. And so we thank you for that. Lord, we would pray tonight for all of those families that suffered loss You know, during those planes that flew into the Twin Towers, you know, we're celebrating 18-year memorial of that, Lord, and the anniversary just seems like yesterday, Lord. I I know where I was at. I know what I was doing. I know the people that were around me. You know, I can see that as vivid today, and the shock that, you know, as I turned on the radio because someone had to tell me what had happened and, and to hear it, Lord, and then to find the nearest TV to see it. Unreal, Lord. And the the images, Lord, of those people having to make a choice whether to burn to death or leap to their death haunted me, Lord. I had nightmares for years. Still bothers me to this day. Lord, we pray for those families and we pray for all of those people who rushed in, the firefighters and the police officers and, you know, the first responders, Lord, and all those people that attended the people, Lord, and and all the rescuers, Lord. We, We pray for them. We pray for those people that didn't allow that plane to reach its destination. One of them plowed into the ground there in in Pennsylvania, Lord. Lord, we just, you know, what a tragic thing. And we just lift that before you this evening. You know, in light of the things we're going through, that doesn't seem like much, you know, what we're going through compared to what those people went through. Lord, and are still going through some of those illnesses that are still plaguing people uh, that happened during all of that dust that they ingested into their lungs, Lord. So we just, again, we lift that to you, Lord. It's not something we ever want to forget. What hatred can do, what what hatred can do, what hatred can cause people to do. Um, And so, Lord, we just, uh, again, we we lift that whole scene before you, and we pray for the needs of the people in our fellowship. Again, Lord, as, uh, you know, we want to lift up before you Susan Stubblefield. And, uh, Lord, we just pray not only would you heal her physical body, but you would also just encourage her, Lord. Strengthen her, Father. Heal her, Lord, is our prayer, Lord. And, And, Lord, we know just already from just the one artery being unplugged how much you know better her circulation is even some of her eyesight's coming back what will it be like when they unplug the other two um you know (laughs) talking to them just a little bit ago on the phone just you know woe to you jim if you think you couldn't keep up with her before just lord bless them and heal them lord is our prayer and everyone else that's struggling lord especially gary with his back problems we just lift that to you lord And we ask that you'd heal that. And every financial problem, every spiritual problem, every emotional problem, every marital problem, Lord, that you would heal those things, Father. So we honor you. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's kids would say, amen. Amen. Well, spend a few moments greeting one another before you settle into your spot this evening. Hey, let's turn our Bibles to the book of Proverbs. We've come as far as verse... 7 of chapter 1 and that's where we'll pick up again this evening and so as you're turning there let's pray and and just invite God to through the work of his spirit to instruct us from his word this book of wisdom tonight father we thank you that not only have you given us you know from your heart your word it's God breathed all of it from Genesis to Revelation but Lord one of the most insightful books on just how we ought to live out the Christian life in wisdom is given to us here in the book of Proverbs. Uh, Lord, you had blessed this man with divine wisdom, Solomon. So, Lord, there is just not only is it your word, but there's just a kind of a double anointing on it. And so one of the most incredible books in the Bible uh, when it comes to just giving us instruction on how we ought to act, how we ought to think, how we ought to behave, Uh, the people we ought to associate with, the people we shouldn't associate with. And again, Lord, this evening as we finish out chapter 1, 
you're going to lay out in a very clear way the instruction of a father to a son. And it's, it's like you instructing us, your children. And then you're going to tell us the warnings. And then, Father, you're going to bring to us the consequences if we don't heed those warnings. And there are always consequences. And then you're going to give us the rewards at the end of the chapter for those who are obedient. So Lord, as we look at these things, you know, speak to our hearts tonight, not just our heads. We would pray. Let these things settle in. Uh, Let them just massage, Lord, our spiritual hearts. Let them burn in us. Brand these things upon our hearts, Lord, we would pray. And may, Lord, they become Uh, just how we live. May we live these things out, we ask. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's kids would say, amen. Again, by way of reminder, last week, you know, as uh, we gave you the introduction to the book of Proverbs, we told you that Proverbs deals with four kinds of people. And just make note of that as we're going through. And in fact, it'll come to the fore again this evening as we're looking at the rest of chapter 1. The first person it deals with to try to impart wisdom to is the person who's immature. Um, Here Proverbs, Solomon does, he calls them simple. It's not that, you know, there's any um, resistance to learning. They just haven't learned. They're immature. And every one of us start out as immature people in the body of Christ, don't we? We come into this thing brand new. We come into this thing not knowing anything, but Jesus saved us. But we are called to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we're going to see Sunday morning, as we are plugged into the source, we as the branches ought to be bearing fruit because we're plugged into the source. And so he talks about the simple person, but then he moves to the fool. Now the fool is the one who's received instruction but won't apply it. For whatever reason, they think that they're wiser than God. They're wiser than God's word. And again, like I told you last week and I told you Sunday, I'm so glad that I know just enough to know that I don't know. Thus, I trust God's Word. You know, I don't argue with it. I I, I don't try to reason it away. I believe that God speaks very clearly. I believe He means what He says and says what He means. And I believe all Scripture is to be taken literally unless God tells you to take it figuratively. And He does. And those moments where you can use it allegorically, he tells you when to do that. So it's pretty simple to follow God's word. In fact, I love what our pastor Chuck used to say. He used to say that it's written at a sixth grade level. And so if you, if you are having education, at least at a sixth grade level, you can understand God's word. It's not complicated. If you go to our website, you know, the, 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 you know Todd's been working on it, Pastor Todd. He's got the banners rotating now, finally. We figured all that out. But... It, you know, the, the title theme of our website, so people can go there, and we have a lot of people that visit that website for the teaching, is simply teaching the Word of God simply. And, that, and that's, that's the key. That's, that's the goal. And so you have the simple, but then you have the fool that just won't listen. They're wiser than God, and so they go about with their own reasoning to try to figure out life until finally life collapses in on them, and then they cry out. But then you have the scoffer or the scorner. And I pray that nobody in this church ever becomes one of those people. Because not only have you not learned from God's word, not only have you not applied God's word, you're not simple and you're not foolish, but now you begin to scoff at God's word. Uh, you, You begin to actually criticize it. And to some degree, you will blaspheme it if you're not careful. But then the fourth person is the wise person. And that's where we kind of ended in verse 5 the last week after the introduction. Let's take a look at it again as we read through 6 and 7 to get a start at what we're going to be looking at this evening, the rest of chapter 1. He says there in verse 5, a wise man. And of course, man is in the italics. It could be a wise person, man or woman. A wise person will hear. And that word again for hear in the Hebrew is to lean in. It is to listen very carefully without any preconceived ideas. To acknowledge the truth that God is speaking and then with the intent or desire or passion to apply those things to your life. 
the wise man leans in and he hears, watch what he says, he hears, and a man, and, and will increase in learning, and a man of understanding will attain unto wise counsel. Not only will he lean in and listen, but he'll seek out wise counsel because he knows, as we, you know, we shared last week, he knows that he doesn't know and he needs. In the multitude of counselors, every purpose will be established. He seeks out wise counsel. To understand the proverb, the interpretation, the words of the wise, and these deep sayings, this deep wisdom God wants to impart to us through his word. So that was the introduction. But here is the key. Verse 7 is the key before we launch into the application. The key is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. The beginning, he's telling us, of any knowledge, of understanding any of the deep proverbs of God, of applying any of this wisdom to your life, the beginning, the starting off place is the fear of the Lord. We're going to see 17 times that phrase is used in the book of Proverbs. 27 times in the Bible as a whole. Isn't that amazing that when you study from Genesis to Revelation, all of those chapters and verses, this phrase, the fear of the Lord, is only used 27 times. But 17 of them are found right here in the book of Proverbs. Because Proverbs is designed to impart wisdom, and you will never, listen, you will never learn from God's mouth to your heart until you have the fear of the Lord. And we told you last week what that was because it's described in chapter 8, verse 13 of Proverbs. Let's read it real quickly. Let's just take a moment to remind ourselves as we move through it again. Like I told you guys last week, I, I'm not going to go at the pace I normally do. This is not a, a, a sprint. This is just going to be a marathon. We're going to jog through the book of Proverbs till we get to the end. Okay? So, you know, I've asked you to just kind of relax. Let me relax. Um, there's a lot of things in the book of Proverbs that are important for us to look at, and we kind of just need to kind of hover around it for a little bit and kind of meditate on it, you know, and kind of absorb it and kind of bask in it because, listen, these things are designed, these Proverbs given to us by Solomon. He wrote over 3,000, and we only have 600 of them uh, in existence today that we can glean from. But they're designed to make you and I wise, to give us discretion in every decision that we make, in every action of our life. It is to give us so that we act in the way that God would have us to act, so that we can be blessed. But there in chapter 8, verse 13, he says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And again, I told you last week that you will never flee anything that you love. You'll always struggle with it. And you have to ask the Lord to teach you, to put in your heart, because only the Lord can do that, a hatred for evil And then he describes what the evil is. It's pride. You know, we're going to get to chapter 13 of Proverbs, verse 10, and we're going to find that only by pride comes contention. Pride is at the source of every contention, every strife, every division. It's pride. And arrogancy. Arrogancy is pride applied. That's what arrogancy is, is when you think you know better than anybody else and you can't hear because you're right. That's arrogancy. And the evil way, because arrogancy will lead you into the evil way, and the forward mouth, that is the mouth that resists, the mouth that rebels. You know, some of you parents have had kids with forward mouths, and you know what it looks like. No other explanation needed. He says here, do I hate? God hates that. In James it says, God will resist the proud. That's an amazing statement, isn't it? Think with me for a moment. James, the uterine brother of Jesus, who grew up in the same home with Jesus, who was a pastor of the mother church there in Jerusalem, James tells us that God will resist the proud person. Now, let me ask you a question, because it demands a question be answered and asked, right? How many want God to resist you? Any takers? You have not been resisted till you've been resisted by God. I'll tell you. Because he knows how to resist. But he gives more grace. How many want more grace? Not just grace, but more grace. To the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, before the mighty hand of God. Humility is the absence of pride and arrogancy. Humility is to, to, to possess a teachable spirit. And that's what Proverbs is all about. 
So the key to learning anything that we're going to learn as we journey through these 31 chapters is the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way, which I hate, God would say. So you have to come to these uh, truths that Solomon is going to lay out, the wisest man, uh, human, not, not speaking of Jesus, but human ever walked the earth. God granted him that. We need to listen. And you know, the problem is he never applied what he taught either. It messed him up. But he has great wisdom anyway, so let's dive right into our study tonight. Because he moves into verse 8, and now we move into that section, and it'll go all the way through chapter 9, where it is Solomon addressing his son. Now this is an incredible fact that I didn't bring in last week, but I'll bring in this week. You know, we said last week that Solomon had 700 wives. We know he wasn't a very wise man. Had 300 concubines. That's 1,000 in his harem. That would mean that he would see each one of them about once every three years. You know, and then how would you deal with that? You know what? We were talking about that today and with somebody before the service, and we just, there's no way to wrap your hand around it. There is no way to wrap your hand around that. But of all of those wives and all of those concubines, do you understand? And he must have had a multitude of children. He only had one son. Rehoboam. And this is him trying to give instruction to his son. Now how we're going to apply this to us as we walk through these nine chapters is our father, our heavenly father, trying to give instruction to us, his sons and his daughters. Amen? So when we're thinking as we're looking through this First chapter and on into the ninth chapter, we want to view it in that way. Because your heavenly Father loves you. Your heavenly Father, His thoughts toward you, the Bible says, listen carefully, are more than the sands of the seas. The next time you're on the beach, and maybe ladies, next year when you get out there, just pick up a handful of sand and let it flow through your fingers. And and, and then think of all the sand grains on all the beaches in the world. And that's how many thoughts your heavenly Father has toward you. And by the way, He says they're all good. You read Jeremiah 29. He gives promises that you would have a sure a uh, future, a hope. Because that's how your Heavenly Father uh, loves you. But as we read through this, we're going to see some of that love manifest itself in correction. In fact, He's going to tell us that He corrects them that He loves. Amen? How many have been corrected this week? Um, well, let's just dive right in because, I, I, man, I got 45 minutes to get through these verses. Listen carefully. My son. Now he's going to warn him to listen to what he has to say. Then he's going to tell us the consequences for not listening to what he has to say. And by the way, the Bible tells us in Galatians, I was going to have them put that up, but they can now if they want it's out of order. But in Galatians chapter 6, 7, and 8, it says, God is not mocked. Be not deceived. God is not mocked whatsoever a man soweth that he shall reap. For if we sow to the flesh, we shall reap of the flesh correction. But if we sow to the Spirit, we shall reap of the Spirit life everlasting. Now that is a blessed verse and it is a scary verse. Because if you're sowing righteousness and godliness and you're sowing God's will in your life and you're sowing obedience to the word of God then you will reap blessing and everlasting life. If you are sowing to the flesh you're going to reap correction. I guarantee you right now. Corruption is coming your way. And so understand as he's laying this out he's going to say you listen to me. He's going to lay out a scenario then he's going to say if you don't listen to me, this is what's going to happen. And if you do listen to me, this is what's going to happen. And listen, every one of you have a choice. I have a choice. We have a choice. We can choose to listen and be obedient, or we can choose not to listen and be obedient. Even as Christians, we can do that. Would you say amen? How many have known to do right and have not done it? And what happened? What happened? You don't need to tell us. We know what happened because the same thing happened to us. But how many have known to do good and have done it? And what happened? Blessing. So here is the theme for the rest of chapter 1. Let's dive in. My son, 
very intimate relationship he brings us to as a father speaking to his son. My son, hear the instructions of thy father. Forsake not the law of thy mother. What he's saying, there are parents we have given you that are wiser than you that can instruct you if you will listen. And so it's like parents speaking to children. Um, but more pointedly, the father speaking to his sons and daughters. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head. There's a crown that comes with it. And Paul was able to say at the end of his life that he had fought a good fight, he had finished his course, he had kept the faith, and there was a crown now waiting for him because of his faithfulness and obedience to the Lord. And he said, not only to me, but all those who love his appearing. It's the Stephanos, it is the victor's crown. And what he's saying is if you are obedient to the words of your heavenly Father, he's saying to us tonight, there's a crown for you, the victor's crown that awaits you, and chains about your neck. That's kind of a reward. Now, my little grandson, I didn't get to be there today because I had to be at the church working, but he, he signed up for track and he ran a race. And my wife videotaped it for me. And he came in ahead of half of the pack. And so he got a ribbon around his neck with a little medal. And she had a picture of him. He's all proud. You know, this is his first thing he's done because he doesn't like basketball. He doesn't like volleyball, but he likes track. Everywhere the kid goes, he runs. So he'll be good at this. He'll run under your feet. He'll trip you. He's a runner. But he ran as so to win, and then he had this thing put around his neck. And that's what he's saying. You will be rewarded with a medal, a ribbon, a chain around your neck if you will be obedient. There are rewards in this. He says now, here's the warning, my son, if sinners entice thee, and listen, you will always be, note this, in this life enticed by something. You're either going to be enticed by your fleshly desires because, you know, the spirit wars against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. We have two people as born-again Christians occupying the same place, but we, we have this flesh, and this flesh wants what this flesh wants. It feels what it feels. It desires what it desires. It aspires to what it aspires. But it, this flesh can deceive us because over and over in the Bible, it tells us, be not deceived. It tells us that because we have the capacity to deceive ourselves. So you have the flesh, but then you also have the devil. You have your enemies always whispering in your ears the wrong things. You have the devil. You have the flesh, you have the devil, and then you have the world, other people. And they're always vying for your attention. Always trying to lure you away, to entice you to do something you should not be doing. And here he says, listen, my son, if sinners entice thee, consent not. Consent thou not. Now, that's an important phrase, and that's why I want to kind of go slowly through the book of Proverbs, because there's some important phrases here. What it's actually saying, you have to give consent to that. At some point, in your life, you consent to do evil. You consent to listen to that enticement. You consent to go that way. You consent to fall into that trap. You have to give consent to it. Do you know that? Because your Heavenly Father is trying to protect you. And He says, when these things come to entice you out of the will of the Father, contrary to His Word and to His instruction, to His knowledge, to His wisdom... When that enticement comes, don't give consent to it. Bring it captive, as Paul would say, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Do not consent to it. Don't think another thing about it. Reject it. Walk away from it. Go to God's Word and find out what He says about it and get instructions concerning it. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us lurk privately for the innocent without a cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as the, they go down to the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We will fill our houses with spoil. And listen very carefully to verse 14 because here's the power in that enticement. 
cast in thy lot among us. There's something about this being accepted. Uh, you know, I've read documentaries uh, about um, gangs and how gangs have such influence in a lot of the inner city kids. And it's because there's a sense of acceptance. They prey on a lot of these kids who do not, no longer have fathers in their lives. In fact, Barna's research says that 90% of all violent crimes are committed by young men who do not have a father in their life. The father is either absent out of their life or he is not engaged in their life at all. 90% of violent crimes come from that. And so these kids grow up in an environment, they grow up in the inner cities where they have need of being accepted, a sense of belonging to something because all of us have that. Let your sense of belonging come from the Lord. Let your identity come from Him. Listen, you and Him should be enough. You don't need to be accepted by anybody else. I, I love what some of the old, you know, reformers wrote. L listen, you know, one man standing on the Word of God is a majority. In other words, he's challenging us to be able to stand alone. To stand up and stand alone. To be willing to stand on God's solid truth and not be enticed with this sense of belonging and listening into this kind of a crowd mentality, be willing to be the odd man out. Be willing to stand alone. This is what Solomon is telling his son. Cast in thy lots among us. Let us all have one purse. Watch what he says in verse 15. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. Now, there's a couple other passages. We want to look at Psalms chapter 1. Very interesting psalm. And again, I would encourage you at some point in your life not only to read the psalm of the day. Today's the 11th. You should have read the 11th, I mean proverb of the day. You should have read the 11th proverb. But as you build up to this, read five psalms. So chapter 1 of Proverbs, the first five psalms. Chapter 2 of Proverbs, the next five psalms. And when you get to the end of the month, you will have read all of Proverbs, and you'll read all of the Psalms. Because the Psalms is another one of those books that it, it, it imparts to us wisdom. But in Psalms 1, verses the 1 through 6, it says this, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now let me ask you, can Christians give you ungodly counsel? Have you ever gotten ungodly counsel from another Christian? Have you gotten ungodly counsel from Christian books? Listen, I'm going to tell you, I had somebody ask me today, have you read this book? And I said, no, I'm still working on the first book. What's that? The Bible. You know, because any other book written, no matter how good it is, it's still written by man. There's only one book that says of itself, it is inerrant and it is inspired of God. It is God-breathed. And here, the psalmist says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. You can't believe. We, the bulk of our counseling, Pastor Todd and I, are people outside of our church. And you can't believe. There's a large church not far from here that does no biblical counseling. They send these people to clinical psychologists that are humanists. And they've so messed up these people, you, they, 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 they won't even hear the word of God anymore. And their lives are in ruin because of it. Walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners. Watch the progression. Because you're moving, and now you find your way walking in the counsel. Pretty soon you're standing in the way of sinners, nor be seated in the seat of the scornful. Because that's where it will end up. But then he says this, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, in the word of God. And in the word or the law doth he meditate day and night. That's where he seeks his wisdom and counsel. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaves also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth, it shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. 
but they are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the day of judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. And now listen to what the psalmist says here in verse 6. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. When you begin to listen to ungodly counsel and walk down that path, the end of it is devastation. But when you listen to what God has to say, the end of it is blessing. God is not mocked whatsoever man sows he reaps. So here the father is saying to the son, when you are enticed, and there are many forms of enticement, he just uses this one as an example. He says to them, my son, walk not thou in the way of them. Refrain thy foot from their paths. Now watch what he says in verse 16. For their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain, this is an interesting concept, surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. Uh, you know, it's like you see the net being spread. You see it. God's word exposes it. And yet you fall into it anyway. Now, let me ask you this. How foolish is this? You know, I've often said it's, it's the thing of a, of a mouse trap. And you know, when we had a guy with a tractor stir up some, some of those critters over here, and they tried to come in here, and we had to get an exterminator, and he set up these giant traps, and I'd be up in my office, and I'd hear these things going off, man. And it would be shocking and frightening the way, because these are not the kind you can buy at the store. These are commercial grade, and... When they slam shut, they slam shut. And so, uh, but you know what? He didn't make those things. He didn't put up signs. I'll tell you when the exterminator came. Trap, beware. Death awaits. Watch out. Don't step here. Be careful. He didn't put in. You know what he did? He made it look like a plate of cheese. And some of them a peanut butter sandwich. I don't know what it is about cheese and peanut butter, but I guess mice like it. And what they thought they were getting was a reward. And every time I'd hear one of those things go off, and thank God, because he said once he gets the, the, the head male and the head female, that the rest of them will leave and go somewhere else. Thank God we got rid of those critters. They, were, they weren't as poor as a church mouse. They were carted out of here in bags. But it looked like something very inviting, very enticing. until they stepped in it. And listen to what he's going to say. You have to be blind because God has made you to see. He's made you wise to step into the traps. Shakespeare said there are none so blind as those who will not or refuse to see. And here God to Solomon, speaking to his son, probably Rehoboam. He's saying, listen, surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird, and they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privately for their own lives. They don't know it, but that's what they're going to ensnare. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain. If it's fleshly, if it's... And, and the word for greedy means any self-appetite. Anything that pleases the flesh. It's a greedy thing. The, greedy for gain, which take away the life of the owner thereof. Listen, the end result of falling into those traps is you're going to give your own life away. By not listening, you will forfeit your life. Now verse 20 says, now listen carefully. So he's kind of laid out this scenario. My son, if people entice you, don't listen. Don't throw your lot in with them. Have nothing to do with them. Don't walk in their ways. Avoid them. Because what is really happening is when they walk away from the Lord and His wisdom and His ways, they are headed for destruction. And now he's going to say, here are the consequences, my son, for not listening. Now, listen, you may be here tonight and God may be trying to speak to you or you might be watching my live stream or, want, or listening to our internet. You know, we, we have like over 151 subscribers that just go out over YouTube that get this message automatically. If you're here tonight and God is trying to speak to you and you are resisting it, you need to stop. 
You need to stop. I beg you, you need to stop. Because it won't go well for you. And here Solomon is going to cry out to his son and tell him how bad it will go. Listen to what he says. Verse 20. Wisdom crieth out or without. Now let me, let me say something here but in case we're confused. This is not the Lord. This is wisdom. Don't confuse it because if you don't listen and you get in trouble, listen, God will be gracious, but wisdom won't. Wisdom will mock you because you didn't listen to it in the beginning. Um, so listen carefully what it says. Wisdom crieth without. She utters her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief places of the concourse and in the opening of the gates. The gates are where all the courts were set up. And wisdom is crying out everywhere. When you go down to the courthouse and you watch people that got in trouble for breaking the laws, you can gain wisdom there. You gain it. It's everywhere. God is speaking. He's saying, this is not something that's private or secret. God's word, listen, has permeated every aspect of society. Certainly for us as believers. She crieth out in the cheap places of the concourse. She's in the open gates. In the city, she uttereth her voices saying, now listen carefully, how long you simple ones, you immature ones, will you love your immaturity? Now how long will you just remain simple? How long will you love to be immature and make unwise decisions? How long? The question God is asking is how long? At some point, listen, there's going to be an end to God's tolerance. God will not always strive with man. At some point, there's a consequence that's going to come to your actions. That's what he's saying. Son, know this. When wisdom cries out and you don't listen, when wisdom seeks you and you don't find it, how long can you continue in your ignorance and in your simplicity? How long can you do that and not have consequences is the idea here. Watch what he says. And scorners, you delight in their scorning. You mock God's word. Or you fools hate knowledge. If you don't apply it, listen, if you don't mature from God's word, if you don't apply it like a fool won't, if you mock at it like a scorner, how long do you think God is going to put up with that? I mean, I mean this is heavy stuff. That's why it's a very important book. It's one of the books that I've read to nauseam, and I'm still reading it. I'm still learning from it. He uses one word in verse 23, turn. Do you know the word turn is used more in the Bible or as much in the Bible as return? Turn. 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 Don't be like the dumb horse that has to have a bridle put in his mouth to turn his head. God is saying turn. Turn you at my reproof. Turn. That's the answer. Behold, if you turn, now maybe you're here tonight and you're going in the wrong direction, you're doing things you shouldn't be doing, there's trouble in your life because you haven't been listening. Right now, the Bible says turn. And here's what God says He'll do if you turn at His reproof. Behold, I will pour out my Spirit unto you, the Spirit of wisdom, with all the fruits of the Spirit caught up in it. He will lead you and guide you into truth because that's what the Spirit does. Behold, I will pour out my Spirit unto you and I will make you known. I will make you to know my words. I will give you the wisdom. I will give you the insight. I will give you the understanding. But listen, none of that's going to come to you until you turn. If you will turn at His reproof. Then He says, I'll give you my Spirit and I'll make my words sensible to you. I'll give you the understanding of them so you can apply it. And now watch verse 24. Because I have called. You see, again, I will tell you tonight, there's never a time that I found myself in the discipline of the Lord that I can tell you that He didn't warn me. He didn't call me. I, I just didn't listen. How, how many have been there? Now listen, all of us have been there. That's how we learn. You know, For whatever reason, we human beings have to learn the hard way. Did you notice that? Those lessons sometimes have to leave scars. 
But the times I didn't listen, the times I didn't turn at his reproof, I can't say he didn't call. Because he did. I can look back and see the times he warned me. Because I called and you refused. I have stretched out my hand, that is to rescue you, and no man regarded it. You, you shunned it. You had nothing to do with it. You wouldn't receive it. But you have set at naught all my counsel. You've set it aside and you think that you're wiser than it is and would none of my reproof. You would have nothing to do with the correcting work of the Holy Spirit in your life. You would not listen is the idea. Then he says in verse 26, this will be the consequence of not listening. I also will laugh at your calamity. Wisdom is going to say, because I reached out to you, because I called you, because I tried to reprove you, because I tried to correct you, and you would have nothing to do with it. You refused it, you rejected it, I reached out my hand to help you, and you slapped it away. He says, then I will laugh in that day when calamity comes, because it's coming. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock you when fear cometh. Listen, in the ways of the Lord is peace. If you're experiencing fear, there's something wrong. But wisdom will say that I will mock you when fear comes your way. When your fear cometh as desolation, your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then he says, when the consequences come, then you shall call upon me, but I shall not answer. You're not going to find that wisdom. Why? Because you've already seared your mind and conscience not to listen. You know, you form muscle memory when you don't listen. You form muscle memory when you do listen. And, and this is what he's saying. Um, when you call upon me, I shall not answer. Hey, let's look at Isaiah chapter 66. There's something there that's the same. You know, it's interesting as, as you read through the Bible... Um, there's nothing that you're going to find in Proverbs. It's not mentioned someplace else. It's not explained or taught. In Isaiah chapter 66, the last chapter of the book of Isaiah, the first four verses, we have some incredible insight given to us by Isaiah. Isaiah says this, Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build unto me, and where is the place of my rest? See, they were promising early on, man, Lord, we love you. We want, we want to build you a really nice house. We want to do all these things for you. And the Lord said, really? Uh, you know, I'm God. What are you going to build for me? Then he says this, for all those things which my hand hath made, everything, the earth, the heavens, the universe, all those things have been, saith the Lord, but to this man, and it's, again, it's it's gender neutral to this person. Will I look? How many want God's attention? How many want God looking your way? Even to him that is of a poor and contrite spirit. There's humility, there's brokenness. And who trembleth at my words. The words have impact. But then he goes on to say, he, now listen carefully, he's going to describe those people who don't listen, although an Obviously, these are religious people because they're offering sacrifices to the Lord. And he's going to say, these are what these sacrifices look like to me when you offer them and you're not listening to me. He says this, He that killeth an ox, that is, in a sacrificial way, is as a man to me that slew a man. When you slay your ox to bring it and sacrifice it to me, if you're not listening to me, if you don't have a broken and contrite spirit, you're not trembling in my word, it, to me, it's just like you slew a man. He that sacrifices a lamb as he that cuts off a dog's neck. A dog is an unclean animal. You never offered that to the Lord. He that offered an oblation as he that offereth swine's blood. He that burneth incense and, is, and if, if he blessed it as though he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways. This is what God says to people who say that they're serving Him and yet they're, they're choosing their own ways and, and walking in their own wisdom. He says, when you bring your sacrifice to me, this is what it looks like. You bring your ox, it looks like you slew a man. You, you know, you bring your lamb, it's though you're bringing swine's blood. It's, you burn your incense, it's like you're worshiping idols. This is how I detest this. 
God detests pride because you have chosen their, your own ways and their soul delighteth in their own abominations is the idea. Now watch what he says in, in, in verse 4. I also will choose um, their delusions. I also will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them. Because when I called, none did answer. And when I spake, they did not hear. But they did evil before my eyes. And they chose that which I delight not in. You know, it's not a light thing to be disobedient. This is how God views it. Heavy, isn't it? That's why I like studying Proverbs, because it's a book that rebukes me. Um, again, he goes on to say here, watch it back up in verse 27. When your fears come upon you as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, because you didn't turn at my rebuke, then shall you call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge, and did, not, and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would have none of my counsel. They despised all of my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them and we have one verse that promises reward for being obedient can you imagine that? look at all the warning look at all the time he spends on the consequences for not listening and turning at the reproof of the lord but he comes to one verse and he says this and listen to what he says but whosoever hearkeneth leans in listens intently listens carefully listens passionately with the desire to be obedient to what God is saying. But whosoever hearkeneth unto me, this is the Lord speaking, shall dwell safely. There's safety in it. There's security in it. There's confidence in it. There's a standing in it. Um, there's health and wholeness in it and shall be quiet not stirred no anguish no worry no fret no concern because he said when you follow his ways there's a quietness that comes with that and you're going to be quieted from the fear of any evil because the Lord will protect you and he launches into chapter 2 which We'll wait till next week to get that because, again, he starts with my son. And again, now he's going to work his way through the application of God's word and the benefits of the application of God's word and how wise the application of God's word will make you, how it will warn you, the things that it will keep you from that can harm you. That's what he's going to talk about in chapter 2. But chapter 1 is very unique because we have the introduction in the first six verses of him telling us why these Proverbs is set to pen and paper, the importance of listening to those things. He tells us the key to the application of these Proverbs is the fear of the Lord. And then he lays out in a very clear and concise way through the rest of chapter 1 these warnings to his son not to be deceived, not to give consent when this enticement comes to wickedness, but to stand alone against it, to stand on God's word. Because if you don't, this is what's going to happen. One day, if you don't turn in his reproof, one day when you don't reach out for his hand when he's trying to drag you out of the pit that you're in, he says one day that wisdom that reached out to you will mock you. It will laugh at you. Now, there's a beginning and an end to that, I'm, I'm sure, especially in the covenant of grace, but it will mock you. But then he ends this chapter in verse 33 which is the simplest of blessings. But in contrast to what will happen to those who don't listen, 
Here's what happens to those who do. But whosoever hearkeneth unto me, you're going to dwell safely. And you're going to be quiet. There's going to be peace, stability. That's what you're going to experience from any evil. You won't fear anything that's going to come your way because you're secure in your obedience to the Lord. Amen? I have never once in the 30, almost five years of being a senior pastor and counseling with people, not one time has anybody ever walked into my office for counseling that the trouble that they're experiencing cannot be traced back to a violation of God's word. Not once. And I've thought it through carefully. Not one time has somebody walked in my office who needed personal counseling, whether it's just a man or a woman or a couple or whatever, has ever come and, and sat down and spilled out their woes to me that cannot be traced back to a violation of God's word. And many times I will ask them, did not the Lord warn you? And they'll say, yeah, but... Well, there's your problem. One of the best sermons I ever heard was by the assistant pastor of Chuck Smith, Romaine. Years ago, I mean, this was years ago, we were at a pastor's conference. There was just a few hundred of us there. That's when Calvary Chapel movement was small. And Romaine uh, got up and he said, I want to dispel a rumor because there's a rumor going around amongst you Calvary Chapel pastors that I'm Chuck Smith's yes man. And I want to clear this up right now. It is absolutely true. He's my pastor and I'm totally submitted to him. And then he told us to turn to a passage and he said, my message today is going to be killing the yabbit. And my mind is racing because I have read through the whole Bible and I never remember reading about a creature called the yabbit. I am, I am trying to tap any resource in my mind. What in the world is this man talking about? Now he's Chuck Smith's assistant and Chuck has asked him to teach us senior pastors so he better have something to say. But what is the yabbit? And then he went on and it made sense because he was speaking from Proverbs. So often when God instructs, so God, often when God tries to reprove, so often when wisdom reaches out his hand to help you in a time of you not making good decisions, when you bat that away, that's the yeah but. Yeah but. You think you know better. Yeah but. Nobody can love this woman. Yeah but. Nobody can respect this man. Yeah, but like yours is a, is a uh, isolated case, and yet the Bible says it's not. Instead of saying, yeah, but, say, yes, sir. It'll go much better for you. Amen? Yes, sir, Lord. Yes, sir. Your servant hears, and he's going to be obedient. Because when that happens, what flows to you is this peace, this confidence, the blessings of the Lord. Make it your life's aim to know just enough to know. Know just enough to know that you don't know. Thus you trust what God's word says. Listen, let me say this as we end our setting. Let's have the worship team come on up and we'll sing our last song. Let me say this to you. The word will cut you. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us that, correct? The word of God will cut you. But it doesn't cut you to harm you. Now when it cuts you, it may hurt. God never promised that his correction wouldn't hurt. His promise was is his correction wouldn't harm it's for your good. It's for my good. It's for our good. Amen? So the next time you feel the Word of God cutting, understand it's not an instrument of destruction. It's not, as it were, a knife in the hand of an enemy. It's the scalpel in the hand of the surgeon because there's cancer growing in you that needs to be removed. Turn. God would say to us tonight, at my reproof, And I will pour out my spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. I will pour it out upon you. And I will make you to understand. 
what it is I'm saying. And the words are good. And the key, the key, the fear of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now let me ask you this. Let's all stand. We're going to have one last song and then we'll close. Let me ask you this tonight. How many did the Holy Spirit speak to your heart tonight when we were teaching through this word? Yeah. How many are in a place where um, you need to listen? There's some things even this week that I need to listen to. There's things all through my life I need to listen to. We need to train our ears to hear. Amen? Because his warnings are for our good. Would you say amen to that? Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Amen. You know, we go through Proverbs. Whew. Um, but you know what, Lord? It's good. It's good that we hear these things. It's good that we be reminded of these things. Because left to our own devices, left to our own feelings and emotions and thoughts and our own wisdom, our own thinking, we can get ourselves in a lot of trouble. But if we will just come back to what you say, to what your instructions are, and that, Lord, when those instructions have to, to correct us, that we would turn and allow your Holy Spirit, Lord, to bring into our lives that direction and that peace as you make known your will and your way and your words to us, Lord. May we be those kind of a people, Lord. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus we ask and all God's kids would say, amen. Let's worship. I lift my eyes up unto the Father, tonight we pray that we do know where our help comes from. And that, Lord, we receive, and we're going to see that in the next chapter, that we receive your word, we treasure it. And those who read ahead will see this. And we apply it. We receive it. We don't reject it. That we don't rebut it. We receive it. 
we treasure it because we know that it's for our good. We treasure it, and then we apply it. We make application of it. And so, Lord, help us to be those people because, you know, Lord, we don't have time. <laughs> we don't have the energy, Lord, to be in the pit. We want to be in the place of blessing, and so help us to do that, Lord, we pray. Mighty name of Jesus, we ask. All God's kids would say, Amen. Amen. Hey, if you need prayer, we'll be right up here to pray with you and for you. Come on up. And other than that, you can be dismissed.